Uh, thank you so much. It's, it's an incredible honor. Uh, it's a thrill, really, for me. Uh, I'm a Westerner. I'm from Northern California. I got to take a hike in the mountains today. Life doesn't get a lot better than that. Um, I want to, of course, thank uh, Bob and uh, Jane and Kate, uh, the board, the sponsors, all of you for being here. Um, if I get a little breathless in the course of this discussion, it's both the hike and the altitude, and it's my excitement about the topic. And I hope that I can uh, follow through on what Bob said and make it uh, both interesting and accessible. Uh, I might stop and go into a little more detail on, on some of the names and concepts and ideas. Uh, I hope you'll bear with me, but I'll, I'll keep my eye on that clock. Uh, you know, as, uh, as Kate said, we did start talking about this uh, back in February of this year, and that was before some of the major events uh, in this crisis, in this unfolding and continuing to this very minute uh, crisis had taken place. Um, but it was not the beginning by any stretch. And I think that's very important to understand, which is why I like to begin from the beginning. I was living in Ukraine with my family. Uh, I was working on, uh, on research for the US Embassy last spring. And last spring was before uh, the so-called Euro Maidan. Maidan just means square in the Ukrainian language. Euro is obvious. Uh, began last fall. Um, but as you can see from this photo, which we took, um, we took, by the way, when we were out pushing our then 18-month-old uh, daughter in her stroller, feeling totally safe on the streets, protests were already happening. Uh, the mood for protest in Ukraine was strong months, indeed years before the Euromaidan began last fall. Of course, if you just listen to media accounts of what's going on in Russia and Ukraine now, you think uh, Russia attacked Ukraine or somebody attacked somebody else and there's a war going on. In actual fact, all of this began from a situation in Ukraine that was fundamentally untenable to the people of that country. And that's what I want to introduce you to first, and then we'll move to where we are today. Now, from at least three years ago, sociologists studying the situation domestically found that the political situation was deeply unstable. And it was unstable for primarily one reason. That was corruption. This is a picture of the home, the palace, of the former president, the deposed president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych. It's called Meshiria. It's located uh, in the territory of what was supposed to be a national park. Uh, he simply took it for himself, about 400 acres, on prime riverfront property uh, north of the city of Kiev. He also uh, built himself a, a hunting club uh, to which he invited all of the wealthiest men of Ukraine. Um, where do you imagine the hunting took place? Obviously also on public land. Um, he built a helipad next to the Marinsky Palace and Marinsky Park in the very center of the city, obliterating the view from that park uh, of the river, famous historic view. He never used the helipad because he was so afraid people would shoot him down if he rode in a helicopter, which, of course, for those of you who've ever spent any time in Washington or New York, you know that means he shut down traffic with his motorcades, another reason people despised him. Um, of course, he had only the finest of things, uh, bought with stolen money, everything gold-plated, and the fine uh, Yanukovych aesthetic he had. Uh, these are all pictures I took when I visited his estate in May. Um, it had been take over, taken over by the protesters. He had his own bowling alleys, multiple, uh, his own galleon restaurant, which could be sailed up and down the river while he entertained his friends lavishly in it, uh, his own boxing ring and complete fitness center. And of course, that's one of two mahogany-paneled gold encrusted billiard rooms that he had in his mansion. Um, of course, wealth does not buy good taste. Um, <laughs> he has a, a stuffed lion in the entrance to his uh, spa and tennis court center, personal, of course. Uh, and then that's his, his personal chapel, um, which I suppose you could argue follows the tradition of, of uh, ornate Eastern Orthodox chapels. But when you get up close, it's really quite gaudy. Um, he did, however, decorate it with multiple uh, stolen 100,000-year-old uh, icons that he took from churches. So um, not a well-respected man by any stretch. His collection of exotic cars and exotic animals was quite impressive. Now, of course, it wasn't only the personal lifestyle of Yanukovych that underscored the corruption in the country. Um, it was also the vast public spectacle. So the relative cost of the 2012 European Soccer Championships, which was shared between Poland and Ukraine, uh, 
cost twice as much to put on in Ukraine as in Poland. And those are all published figures. The Ukrainian people knew that approximately half of what was being spent on this tournament was being stolen and put into Yanukovych's pockets and those of his retainers. Um, there's the famous story of Mr. Boyko's oil platforms. Boyko was the energy minister. He purchased two rigs in order to do oil drilling in the Black Sea. The market rate for those rigs was $200 million. He paid $400 million of taxpayer money for each of the rigs, which meant he walked away with a cool half a billion dollars. Uh, Mr. Yanukovych himself is the proud author of two books, which no one has ever heard of or seen, for which he was paid a $2 million honorarium each. They were published by a heretofore unknown publisher in his home city of Donetsk, and they were printed by a heretofore unknown company based out of Austria. Um, by and large, the Ukrainian government practiced predatory behavior. The tax administration, the customs regulators, health inspectors would show up at any time for any reason to extort money out of ordinary people and wealthy businessmen, with the result that everybody hated the government. Um, the family became the so-called family around President Yanukovych, and think of this as a, as a sort of mafia family, an extended uh, political family, really, more than anything, uh, became famous for their raider attacks on uh, legitimate businesses, so much so that President Yanukovych's son, known as Sasha, the short form for Alexander, who was worth $2 million, which is already an awful lot for a guy who's educated as a dentist, um, by one year into the Yanukovych presidency, was worth $400 million. Um, this, okay. uh, this led to Yanukovych being given the moniker Bandukovich, which combines the Ukrainian word for bandit with his last name. <laughs> so this begins to give you a sense of how the Ukrainian people thought about their government for months and years before the Euromaidan began. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the uh, skillfully done. The, the Euromaidan broke out, though, for a different reason. And that was that Yanukovych had promised, and this was the saving grace of his presidency, that he was going to sign an association agreement with the European Union. And the European Union to ordinary Ukrainians meant an end to corruption. It meant systemic reform. And above all, it meant living decently. Well, in late November of last year, Yanukovych announced that he wasn't going to sign that agreement. And the result was this, that people by the hundreds initially, and then the thousands, and then the tens of thousands, and then maybe more than 100,000, filled the central square, the Maidan, the, the independent square in the center of Kiev. Now, their initial demands in late November of last year were really not political. In fact, I'm told by reliable sources who were in the crowd that the protesters refused to allow political parties to come in and wave their flags and kind of co-opt the protest and try to turn it to their political ends. In fact, they blocked the politicians. Everybody from Yulia Tymoshenko, you know who I'm talking about, Princess Leia with the blonde braids who was in prison. Her party, the Fatherland Party, was blocked. Udar, the party of Vitaly Klitschko, the boxer, they were blocked. Svoboda, the far-right nationalist party that's had fascist links in the past, they were blocked. It was not a political protest, and it didn't belong to any of the political opposition. It was a people's protest, right? Sounds an awful lot like the way we thought about the Arab Spring. So that's how it started. But then what happened? On the evening of November 30th, the government sent riot police to beat up some students who were camped out in front of the presidential administration. Then the protest changed character dramatically. Ukrainians poured out into the streets in the next days and the beginning of December to demand justice for these young people who had been beaten by their own government. And this, combined with the frustration that I've already told you about, catapulted the protest into an entirely new phase. Social media was absolutely central to the organization of the protest, and in a very interesting way. Uh, we think of Facebook as being cutting edge, dynamic, totally new. In fact, Facebook was relatively static. Facebook was used as a kind of standing resource to find out where to go if you needed medical assistance on the Maidan, if you needed help communicating uh, with foreigners who spoke different languages, because there were, in fact, many foreigners who came to Kiev to participate, if you needed uh, to communicate with the press, if you needed warm clothing, food, et cetera. Facebook was for that. But to actually mobilize people, Twitter was the vehicle of choice. You see here um, a majority of, or a, a large plurality of participants 
went to the Maidan because they heard from a friend or family member that they were going to the Maidan. So all those status updates that your kids and grandkids and maybe great grandkids are constantly doing on their mobile devices can actually change the world um, if, they're, if they're cumulative and if their friends uh, join them in these so-called flash mobs. That actually happened. And here you have uh, some research was done linking the number of Twitter accounts created, new Twitter accounts created, linked to specific dates uh, when major events happened during the Euromaidan. And you can see the huge spikes. I won't go into detail about what actually happened. But people who had not previously been on Twitter were joining Twitter so that they could find out what was going on and when to come to the Maidan. Now, the government used technology too, don't get me wrong. This says in Ukrainian, dear subscriber, you have been recorded as a participant in an illegal demonstration. And that notice would have showed up if you were anywhere in the center of the city, because of course they can tell, because your phone is communicating with the cell phone tower um, during the time of these protests, which is a bit of a chilling effect. Uh, they know your name, you're a cell phone subscriber. You know, you don't necessarily know that the protesters are going to win, and so you might then be on a list and be subject to, um, to retribution from the government. Now, things got worse very quickly in mid-January. Uh, in response to this protest movement that the government simply couldn't control, they decided to take an iron fist approach and passed a set of so-called dictatorship laws. It's, I think of this as the anti-Bill of Rights. Basically, anything guaranteed in the Bill of Rights or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights about free speech, free assembly, freedom of movement, uh, freedom of belief, uh, those things are all negated by these laws. And these laws were actually promulgated by the president and then passed by the parliament. So any hope at that point that the parliament had of retaining a sense of independence and legitimacy, by passing these laws, it became complicit in the Yanukovych authoritarian system. And of course, this enraged the protesters even further. And this was when the protests changed. This is when it became political. So not until January. The protest begins in November. The protesters are out in the Maidan all through the freezing cold winter. And it's not until the snowy, icy month of January that they decide Yanukovych has to go. And the rallying cry of the protest became Yanukovych resign. At that point, the violence that we now associate with the Euromaidan revolution, the barricades, the Molotov cocktails, fighting in the streets of a major, and by the way, beautiful European capital, Kiev is an incredibly beautiful city. That happened after the passage of these dictatorship laws and the politicization of the protest movement. And then of course, once there are deaths, the situation quickly spirals out of control and it becomes a story about revenge for the killings trying to find those responsible, anger, protest, and more death and more violence. Some of the famous images from the protest. Um, it says, by the way, on the, uh, the graffiti on the front of that burned out bus, which had been carrying riot police, it says um, garbage truck, essentially. Uh, so the protesters had a sort of nasty sense of humor. Now, from very late January into mid-February, was a period of, of stasis and negotiations. The center of Kiev was occupied in this way, as you see the red was the protesters, the blue were the government buildings, and by the way, um, my family and I lived right here. So when I watched this stuff unfold live on streaming video on the internet, it was unreal. It was like watching tanks and APCs and snipers in your backyard. Um, and, and the positions were relatively firm. I actually watched as phalanxes of riot police live there was a camera that was showing this from the top of a very tall apartment building, tried to displace the protesters and they would push and push and the protesters would kind of let them through and then close ranks around them and kind of send them running away. So it really was a kind of stasis. Negotiations which were sponsored by the European Union, the United States and Russia uh, went on during this period. Uh, there were various claims that the prime minister and the government right, might resign. They finally did, but only when it was too late. Um, and then in the middle of uh, of February, in this bitter cold, uh, something else changed. And to this day, no one knows exactly how it happened. But this was when the real brutality and the vicious murder began. This was when snipers in balaclavas using, using sophisticated weaponry began to simply murder people. Now the argument has been made that there were murders on both sides. That riot police were being picked off just as protesters were being picked off. What we know for sure is that more than 100 people were killed, um, that they were mostly shot in the head 
uh, by sniper rounds, uh, and that this was a true further transformation and deepening of the crisis so that negotiations at that point became essentially pointless. They were dealing with a regime, uh, with a leader who was seen as a bloody murderer, uh, more, more even than an incompetent dictator as he had been previously described. And so when the EU was proud to announce that they had brokered a ceasefire and a compromise on February 21st, uh, not surprisingly, it didn't stop any of the violence. And Yanukovych, not being entirely foolish, uh, here he is caught by his own security cameras in his palace, um, packed up all of his expensive items, as many as he could fit in about three uh, semi-trucks, and he fled the capital of the city. And that was the end of the Ukrainian government. It's important to understand all of this before we move to the moment when Russia invades Crimea and this becomes about Russia and Ukraine. Because until that moment, until March of this year, this was a story about Ukraine. And when I spoke to my Russian friends and colleagues, we had plenty of common ground. Isn't Ukraine a mess? What can we do? How can we stop the violence? And then Russia invaded and took Crimea, setting this unbelievable precedent in the post-World War II era of seizing territory by force. Now, of course, we know that since that time, Crimea has been in Russian hands, and southeastern Ukraine, the so-called Donbass uh, mining and industrial region, has descended into violent chaos. Now, it's important to note here, because again, I think that the media narrative, um, by and large, exaggerates and polarizes this story, uh, that there are irregular fighters doing very nasty things on both sides. So a lot of the violent folks who had been in the Maidan, who had learned over months in the Maidan and who had been attracted, in fact, by the violence to camp out in the Maidan and to look for their opportunity to fight, those folks then migrated to the southeast, where they put on their own partisan uniforms and picked up weapons and bought and stole um, and went to fight the Russians, or what they call the Russians. So there are these pro-Russian, violent, uh, unaccountable units, and there are also pro-Ukrainians. And here I have a couple of photos just depicting both sides. They're sort of hard to tell apart, right? These are, these are some pretty um, rough characters, not folks you'd want to run into in a dark coal mine uh, late at night. All right, now let's talk about politics. So what is, what is Russia really after here? What is Mr. Putin after with these uh, invasions or quasi-invasions? I think you have to think first about domestic politics. You know, uh, Bob made this point to me earlier on our hike today talking about American foreign policy. Sure, it's true. Domestic politics is non-negligible. Uh, we don't make foreign policy in a vacuum, neither do the Russians. But for Mr. Putin, the events in Ukraine and Russia's role in those events are about more even than just success or failure in politics. Because Mr. Putin has put himself in a place now where if he fails, he dies. There is no day after Putin scenario in the Russian political system. So the events in Ukraine and Russia's response to them are about survival for Vladimir Putin. That is absolutely critical to understand. So what is he trying to achieve then by his intervention in Ukraine? I think first he needs to block the precedent that a duly elected, if authoritarian leader, so Vladimir Putin or Viktor Yanukovych, in that respect they are similar, though in almost no others. Putin, for the record, is a man of law and order. He's a man from the system. He's a secret policeman. Yanukovych had two violent criminal convictions in Soviet times. So pre-1991, Putin was the cop. Yanukovych was the robber. Very different men. They always hated each other. But in this sense, they're similar. And it was vitally important for Putin to send the message, not to the people of Ukraine, but to the people of Russia, that if through violent street demonstrations, you seek to depose me, your life won't get better. And the lesson comes from the chaos in Ukraine. The worse things get in Ukraine as a result of what has happened, and the less they look like the rosy picture that the protesters expected, which is that now Ukraine will become a Western country and everything will be good and normal and prosperous and our children will have a bright future. The less true and the more doubtful that story appears, the more credible and alternative Putin's so-called power vertical in Russia appears to be. And that has to be persuasive not only to ordinary people, but to business leaders and oligarchs. And Putin has done that very successfully. So all he really has to do 
is ensure that Ukraine remains a failed state, that Ukraine remains in chaos, and he succeeds with his number one domestic political aim, which is to make his system a preferable alternative for Russians. But I think second, Putin's image and his identity has become quite closely wrapped up in the ideas around the Ukraine conflict. Putin is now the Tsar. I said this earlier. There, Putin's not a caretaker. He's not what he was when he took over for Yeltsin, a reliable guy who'll play by the rules, who'll, who won't you know, dig up anything nasty or messy about the previous regime. Putin is now the Alpha and the Omega. He is the Tsar. There is no alternative to him. But of course, what that means is he has the ethos of a Tsar. And what does a Tsar seek to be? He seeks to be a historic force in the great nation, in the great civilization of the Russians. And for Putin, his narrative is that he is the Tsar who restored Russia's greatness, who unified the East Slavic peoples, the Rus, as it's historically known, the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians. And in that narrative, keeping Ukraine close to Russia is absolutely vital. So when Putin talks about the Euromaidan movement in Ukraine as having been a Western-backed fascist coup, yes, he is drawing on some actual facts. There is no question. I mentioned Svoboda, the far-right nationalist party. Um, this is the leader of Svoboda, Oleg Tyanibok, giving a Nazi salute. This is the leader of Svoboda, Oleg Tyanibok, meeting with a representative of the United States government, Senator John McCain, right? So he's definitely pointing to a set of facts. Now, he's drawing them together into an absurd conspiracy. But the argument that Putin ultimately makes out of this, which is that what is happening in Ukraine is being imposed from the outside, is being imposed by Americans in particular, by the West, and is a, a, a false fascist ideology against which, let's not forget, the Soviet Union prevailed 70 years ago and saved the world from fascism. This channels a deep commitment on, on the part of the Russian people to what Putin represents. This is the identity of the Tsar unifier who once again emerges from Russian history to save the nation. This is vitally important to who Putin has become, even if it wasn't what he was 15 years ago. And of course, it's worked, right? Nationalism sells. Let's not forget, six years ago, Putin waged a war against Georgia. I personally happen to think that Saakashvili, the leader of Georgia, really asked for it and did some stupid things. But nonetheless, note that, do I have a pointer here? There we go. His popularity during August of 2008 spiked massively. Well, here we are, March of 2014, Crimea invasion, and the fight in southeastern Ukraine afterwards, his population has spiked, uh, his popularity has spiked, notwithstanding that the Russian economy is tanking, right? Nationalism sells even if nothing else does. And this is, again, vitally important to Putin because it is about survival. And then there's the idea of isolation. A normal person would ask the question, well, don't Putin's advisors tell him what's really going on? Don't they tell him that the economy is tanking, and in part it's because of the economic isolation of Russia? And the answer is, when you're this powerful, and this powerful for this long, you become very isolated. And uh, I'm reminded of this hilarious video that uh, a clever Russian satirist put on YouTube. This is, this is Putin and the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, which is hand in glove with the Kremlin, uh, Patriarch Kirill. And, uh, and this is a scene from the Eisenstein film, Ivan the Terrible. And the reason that I juxtapose these two is because there's a famous scene from Russian state television, remember all television now is controlled by the state, in which the patriarch is sitting next to Putin at one of these kind of uh, uh, trumped up, you know, informal meetings that's broadcast on television to show the people how much the president listens to the advice of others. And the patriarch says, you know, Mr. President, I need to tell you something very important. You know that I can only speak truth. It's my religious duty. I say this before God. I say this before the Russian people. But you understand, I have to tell you this. I have no choice. Vladimir Vladimirovich, you are the greatest leader in Russia's history. <laughs> and it's great, because this is exactly the scene, with a little bit more dripping satire, from the Eisenstein movie, where Ivan the Terrible, who was famous for lopping off people's heads and bashing them in, uh, gets the same advice from his uh, trusted confidant, uh, Malyuta Skuratov. And that's where Putin is today. 
So if you're wondering, why aren't people telling Putin the truth? He's an intelligence officer, for God's sakes. You know, he wants to know the facts. He is isolated. The man doesn't know everything that's going on, and he doesn't know whom to trust. And his training itself, I think, feeds into that paranoia and uncertainty. Now, it's not just domestic politics, of course. Geopolitics is relevant as well. It's important to understand that Putin's vision for Eurasia, for the former Soviet space, which, let's not forget, stretches from the heart of Europe all the way to the Sea of Japan and down practically into the Middle East up to the Arctic. This is a huge, huge part of the world. But his vision for this part of the world is not the restoration of the Soviet Union. I'm here to tell you that. If anybody told you Putin is the second coming of Stalin, he's not, okay? There is not a shred of ideology in this man. He has no interest in communism or Leninism or socialism or Sovietism, okay? He's a businessman. He is a CEO. He is an absolutist CEO. He's a tsarist CEO. But at the end of the day, he is interested in profit. So what he has created is the idea of a non-ideological Moscow-centric union of republics that serves Russia's interest and the Kremlin's interest and Putin's interest. That's what he's after. That's the positive vision. And by the way, he makes it worth the while of those who join him. The Belarusians have been living off of Russian subsidies for 25 years. And believe it or not, they actually live pretty well. Um, the Kazakhs, Fred, you know Kazakhstan, they've been living pretty well. And they're part of the customs union as well. The so-called Eurasian union includes a customs union component. But there is, of course, also a negative component of the geopolitics. And that is that Ukraine is a red line. For 20 years, NATO has been expanding in Russia's backyard. From the Russian perspective, and that's what I love about this graphic, because it happens to be in English, but it shows the kind of depiction of American power that I wish were true, but that only Russians can see, and that is that everything that America has is designed to make Russia weak. And if you see the world in these terms, then clearly you believe that Ukraine is the last straw, that if America comes to Ukraine, if NATO comes to Ukraine, then it's game over for Russia, because it's the heart, the heart of, of old Russian Slavic civilization and the soft underbelly of the Russian Federation's defense infrastructure. In fact, a huge component of Russian aerospace manufacturing is actually done in Ukraine itself. Um, so when you wonder, for example, why did Putin go after Crimea first? Well, sure, yes, there was an overwhelming uh, majority of Russian speakers in Crimea. They already had a Navy base there. But fundamentally, Putin was looking to surround Ukraine. So he's in Ukraine's south. He's in Ukraine's west here in this place called Transnistria, separatist region of Moldova, obviously in Ukraine's east. He's in the north because Russian troops are stationed in Belarus, a member of the Eurasian Union. So the idea is Putin could not allow Ukraine to become the next member of NATO, the next chink in Russia's armor. Now those are Putin's core motivations. What about the Ukrainian side? I'm sorry to have to tell you, I think Putin will succeed. I don't think that Ukraine can succeed. And that's because the Ukrainian leadership is caught between a rock and a hard place, partially imposed on them, partially of their own making. First, the rock. Ukraine is surrounded physically, emotionally, economically, legally, and in every other way. Just imagine trying to do business with a country that's in this position. It's, it's almost impossible. Ukraine's armed forces have been neutered. This is a photo that I took two months ago of Ukraine's Navy. I don't know if you can make it out, but there's a, a three-masted tall ship, which is the biggest ship in Ukraine's Navy right now. And that's because the Russians took Crimea. And so the, the, the handful of rusted uh, fighting ships that the Ukrainians had in Sevastopol Harbor are now Russian ships. And in fact, the commander of the Ukrainian Navy went over to the Russian Navy as the deputy head of the Black Sea Fleet, which tells you a little something about the level of morale in the Ukrainian army. A friend actually told me the other day, this was a friend who was part of the OSCE monitoring mission in eastern Ukraine, that the most pathetic people he saw in all of eastern Ukraine were the Ukrainian regular army soldiers. He said of the five soldiers who were manning a, uh, a block post, uh, a sort of pillbox uh, at one of these checkpoints, uh, two of them were barefoot, one of them had flip-flops, and only one of them had an umbrella when it was pouring rain, and they all asked him for cigarettes. So this is the current state of the Ukrainian army. 
Now, separatism obviously continues in eastern Ukraine. The fight is nowhere near over. Um, it's a little hard to make out in this graphic, and of course, the situation is constantly changing. But even though the Ukrainian army successfully took back this northern enclave around Slavyansk, the two huge cities of Donetsk and Luhansk are still very much in separatist control. And since the Ukrainians don't have the sophisticated military capabilities that they would need, and since their military is like Swiss cheese, I mean, it's completely penetrated uh, by Russian intelligence and by Russian sympathizers and by others who are simply opportunistic and would sell information and uh, sell their allegiance at the drop of a hat, I don't expect the Ukrainians to have a lot of success if the separatists continue to put up significant resistance. In addition, the central government in Kiev does not have a lot of reliable, reliable levers of influence that it can deploy in southeastern Ukraine. And that's because President Yanukovych, the deposed former corrupt, bloody, crazy, foolish dictator, was the lever of influence in southeastern Ukraine. He was a hometown boy from Donetsk Oblast. And so all of the government officials who come from there were his people. And the central government in Kiev doesn't have any of them left which plays into exactly the narrative that I told you about before, which is these are people from the outside, from the West. These are people who are being imposed on the population, particularly the Russian-speaking population of Southeast Ukraine. So again, uh, a rock here. Uh, the Russians are very effective here at controlling uh, the information war. Uh, Russian television reaches everybody in southeastern Ukraine, and because they're Russian speakers, they strongly prefer to watch Russian television versus Ukrainian television. You can really hardly blame them. If the Ukrainians wanted to do effective propaganda, they should probably do it uh, in Russian. Um, but obviously, the effect of, of this type of information war is to brainwash people. Um, I, I recall I was in Moscow about a month and a half ago, and I was watching a, a debate program on uh, one of the main state channels, and I stopped. I, normally, I, I just ignore this stuff, but I stopped because I, I saw a friend of mine, um, a guy from Washington. He's, he happens to be a Russian, but he's very recognizable, has kind of crazy, wiry, curly, uh, white hair. And, um, and he's seen in Washington as a shill for the Kremlin. So this gives you a little context. On this debate show, there were eight people total. He was one of them. He was the only one who spoke up during a discussion of the events in southeastern Ukraine to say, you know, um, Russia might want to consider the effect on Russia's other global interests of the way we behave in southeastern Ukraine. That was his criticism of Russian policy. He was immediately attacked by the seven other people on the panel and the host of the show. So this gives you a sense of the type of depiction uh, on Russian television of what's been going on in southeastern Ukraine. And in particular, of course, they emphasize this narrative that this was a coup organized by the United States and for the benefit of Ukrainian fascist nationalists. And this, by the way, is a narrative that goes back into Soviet and Russian history because it is true that there was an uncomfortable moment uh, during and after World War II when Ukrainian nationalists who wanted to break away from the Soviet Union were in a kind of de facto alliance, an uncomfortable alliance with the German invaders. And from the standpoint of the inheritors of the Soviet legacy, they were the worst kind of traitors and they were responsible for the worst kind of crime. So this story sells extremely well 70 years after these salient events of World War II uh, when that memory is still the most important legitimizing story in the history of Russia and the Soviet Union. So uh, the last element of the rock is, of course, gas. We've heard a lot about energy and how Europe needs to be more independent from Russian energy, how Ukraine needs to be independent from Russian energy. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's not going to happen. It's at least not going to happen anytime soon. The kind of change, the kind of fundamental infrastructural change, technological evolution that would be needed to make Europe independent. Look at these numbers, right? Poland, 70%. Austria, 75%. Uh, Italy, 30%. Uh, and then the Baltic states, 100%, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, 100%. That's dependency on Russian uh, sources of fossil fuels for energy, right? You can change things on the margins without going dark completely in half the European continent. You cannot wean yourself in the short term off of Russian gas. And so what that means is Russia will always have leverage through the energy weapon, and it clearly won't be afraid to use it. That's the rock. Let me tell you now about the hard place. This is where I don't want anybody coming away with either of two impressions. One is that the Ukrainians are the good guys and the heroes. 
Okay, the Ukrainians are right on everything and the Russians are wrong. That's not true. And the second is that the people we're dealing with here are somehow sympathetic, that they're nice guys. They're not, okay? This is a picture of the Ukrainian Rada, the Ukrainian parliament. I was there. Um, it's currently surrounded by tough guys in camo fatigues with shotguns and Molotov cocktails right now, today. And all the roads radiating out from the center of Kiev are barricaded. And they stop anyone they want, and they take money and stuff from anyone they want. This is the center of the capital city of Kiev from which the war on eastern Ukraine is being waged by the new Ukrainian government. That's a hard place if ever I saw one. These people are not interested in a, a stabilized, normalized, return to normalcy under the new government. These people have strident demands. They believe that they suffered and they sacrificed and they will not leave the Maidan. And I talked to them. That's the Maidan today. That's the square. That's how it looks. Excuse me. In May. It's exactly the same today. Just a little bit dirtier. And it smells bad because they don't really have facilities there. Um, and people, by the way, are chopping up furniture now for cooking fires and chopping down you know, trees and parks and things like that. So there's a lot of kind of spirit of revolution and kumbaya and excitement. But Kiev is a very bleak, bleak place right now. I, I describe it not as post-revolutionary, but as revolutionary. And the other important thing to understand about the situation in Kiev, in the capital, and of course this is the most important place, this is where the transition of the Euromaidan changed the future of Ukraine, is that actually a lot of the scariest folks, as I was told by people who were on the ground in the Maidan, they said, oh, hey, you know, listen, yeah, I don't like the president. I don't like this new government that's come after Yanukovych. And I said, well, what are you going to do about it? You know, they point to their pistol, you know, whatever. We'll take care of them. Um, they say, but listen, don't, don't take my word for it. My buddy Vanya, he's fighting in the southeast right now against the Russians. They have a derogatory term, the sort of Muscali, the, the nasty guys from Moscow. He's fighting them. And when he comes back, just wait. Then we'll show these guys, these corrupt oligarchs, these fat cat politicians who've taken power after Yanukovych. And on a certain level, they're right. Nothing really has changed. The new Ukrainian government is not less corrupt than the old government. It's not a set of new faces. It's a lot of the same old people with a little extra decoration and some extra rhetorical flourish. That is a hard place if ever I have seen one. And then there's the Ukrainian economy. Ukraine is an extremely poor country. It's one of the poorest countries in Europe, even though it is blessed with this unbelievable agricultural resource of something like a quarter to a third of the most fertile soil on planet Earth is located in that country. The old Ukrainian joke is you can drop a, a, a stick in the ground and it'll turn into a tree. Um, it's an extremely impoverished country. Uh, under Yanukovych, all the foreign reserves disappeared. Uh, the IMF forecasts, and mind you, the IMF has loaned Ukraine $18 billion, so it would be in their interest to see the economy turn around. The IMF forecast is negative 5% GDP uh, this year, and maybe negative 2% next year, and maybe it turns around in 2016, but I tend to think that's optimistic. The currency has depreciated by more than a third this year alone. Foreign reserves are at zero. And in the meantime, the IMF, because it is in the nature of the IMF, is demanding quite harsh conditions from the Ukrainians. They have to keep their currency floating, which means it's going to continue to tank. They have to cut subsidies to ordinary people for utilities, which means gas. So while they're in a gas war with the Russians and they have to pay the Russians uh, to get any gas, they have to also pass those costs along to the ordinary people. Otherwise, it's not a market system. Otherwise, it's being subsidized and the IMF won't support it and the IMF will turn off the loans which the government needs. So they're caught in a vicious circle. The budget deficit, according to the IMF, needs to be 3% of GDP by 2016. I wish we had a budget deficit of 3% of GDP by 2016. It's not going to happen for Ukraine. Um, they need to do anti-corruption reforms, reform the banking system, et cetera, et cetera. All of it's not going to happen. And unbelievably, foolishly, I think, um, almost sort of fantasy land foolishly, they have proceeded with signing an association agreement with the European Union without any of the substantive content that is supposed to change the country into a modern European-style country. So that, I think, raises people's expectations, which are almost certainly going to be disappointed. That's a rock and a hard place. It's hard to make predictions 
uh, it's dangerous too because you might be wrong. But as I said, I think this is headed in a bad direction. Um, I expect Putin to continue to play a double game, even if he cuts a deal with Petro Poroshenko, the candy man, the new president of Ukraine, who, by the way, is not new. So there's Yanukovych, the old guy. There's Putin. There's Poroshenko. Poroshenko was the economic development minister. You think that's a corrupt position under Yanukovych? <laughs> In the last government, right? So that's why I say there's this tremendous skepticism from ordinary people around the new government. Now, what do we do about it? The old Lenin question, что um, делать? There you have some photos of some rather misguided attempts to do things about it. Here's John Kerry getting played by these two politicians who are both servants of Yulia Tymoshenko, um, who's corrupt as the day is long, by the way. I mean, we have evidence. The American court system has already aired evidence in the context of a trial of one of her cronies on money laundering in California that she's stolen at least a quarter of a billion dollars. So, so we know she's corrupt. These are her two best buddies. There's John Kerry thanking them for their service. And, and there's Toria Newland, our Assistant Secretary of State, handing out bagels to middle class people wearing fancy um, uh, warm winter clothes and snowboard helmets that cost like $250 each, which is twice the uh, average uh, annual income in Ukraine, and uh, um, uh, uh, excuse me, month monthly income, and uh, obviously not making herself look terribly good. That's the same woman who was recorded saying something unflattering about the EU that was, that was leaked later on in a phone call. So um, what, what can we actually do? Um, let me suggest a few things. There, there is no silver bullet solution here, right? So the, the temptation of Americans who are problem solvers to solve the problem is misguided. We won't solve this problem. What we can do is practice the Hippocratic Oath in foreign policy. Avoid making things worse for us. Because at the end of the day, we should care about our interests first. Um, and I recommend three levels of action. Uh, one is in the short term, and that's to avoid accidents. We're fighting an information war. We know that events can escalate quickly when things are blown out of proportion by false information, and this has been all about false information, including the so-called intelligence that's been released over and over. Um, so we need to get observers everywhere on the ground. Right now, we only have about 200 OSCE observers, that's Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is the only security organization in the region that includes both Russia and the West. We need more of them. We need to get their mandate extended so that they have a permanent presence. We need them all up and down the Russian-Ukrainian border, and we need information in order to prevent accidents from spiraling out of control. That's to stop the bleeding. Second, I think if we want to be effective in dealing with the Russians, we have to stop trying to play Russian domestic politics against Putin. The goal of the so-called targeted sanctions, and a new round of sanctions was announced by the United States and the European Union about four hours ago today. The goal of many of these sanctions has been to try to split the Russian elite. I'm here to tell you that won't work. Mr. Putin has been extremely effective. Remember this guy, Mikhail Khodorkovsky? who spent more than a decade in prison. He used to be the richest man in Russia and one of the richest men on the planet. There was just a settlement announced today of the shareholders of his company, Yukos, and they were awarded against the Russian government $50 billion in the largest arbitration settlement in history uh, for the theft by the Russian government of his assets. They stole his assets. Everybody applauded. And the reason is because the Russian oligarchs know where their bread is buttered. Yes. They love to keep their families in London, or in Florida, or in the south of France, and their girlfriends in Turkey, and Egypt, and wherever else. But at the end of the day, they know where their bread is buttered. That's Igor Sechin, one of the major Russian oligarchs, together with Vladimir Putin. He makes them whole again. Vladimir Putin is the richest man on the planet. The Russian Tsar is always the richest man on the planet. And one of the foolish things that we keep trying to do with our sanctions is to find Putin's pot of gold. Where's that secret account that's got $150 billion in it so that we can sanction it and freeze it, and then we can really tell Putin what to do? Well, I've got news for you. Putin's secret account is Russia. As long as he controls Russia, he is the richest man on the planet, and he's not going to give it up because it's his personal property. That makes him wealthy beyond any of our imagination, and he will make these oligarchs whole. And in fact, the more that we make lists of good oligarchs and bad oligarchs, 
the more we look incompetent to the Russians, and the more they say, thank God we have a smart leader who knows how to play these foolish Americans. And in fact, I would argue that even beyond that, if we're going to make lists, we're putting the wrong people on the lists. Because the guys we're putting on the list, by definition, are the ones who have accounts in the West, which means they do business with us, which means they talk to us. The ones we're not putting on the lists are the ones who don't talk to us. And they are the real troublemakers. They are the ones who are saying crazy things on Russian television. They don't have minds for business. They're not interested in stability so that they can trade and have predictability and not wild fluctuations in the value of the ruble. Those are the crazy people who are becoming empowered as a result of our targeted sanctions, while the people that we can talk to and who had previously had influence on Putin are becoming disempowered. So we need to fix the way we approach sanctions. I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. Lastly, long term. I've already said I don't think Ukraine's going to be a success in the short term. But it could be a success in the long term only if we give it sustained attention. And here's where it's vital that we avoid what has happened repeatedly in the past in the history of American engagement with that region, and that's Ukraine fatigue. We got excited after 1991. We sent a bunch of money and a bunch of people over there. And then we realized, oh, it's still this corrupt post-Soviet mess. So we kind of started ignoring it for 10 more years. Then we got excited again in 2004 with the Orange Revolution and Yulia Tymoshenko, and we sent our reporters and our money and USAID over there for about six months, and then we decided, gosh, you know, they're still corrupt, so we're not interested. Well, guess what? We're excited again. How long do you think it'll last? If you think it's going to last more than 18 months, I'd love to sell you some real estate in Siberia. I think we need to bring Ukrainians to the West. Now, does it mean that we give them permanent residency, that we become the asylum refuge for Ukrainians? I don't know. Look at the immigration crisis. We probably can't do that. But at least rotate them through. The Europeans have a great program called the Erasmus program that allows people from different European countries to spend as much time as possible moving around the EU. And that enables them to understand in a personal way what reforms and transparency and rule of law and good governance can do. Ukrainians don't understand that. Less than 10% of Ukrainians have ever been to the West, to the EU or the United States. If we want them to pursue these kinds of reforms and understand something other than a bribe or a gun, they have to experience it themselves. So I think travel and exchange is always a good thing, and I think we shouldn't be stingy about that. Um, and then I think we need to preserve our own knowledge base about this region. I know I've, I've just spent uh, an hour talking to you about this subject, uh, but actually uh, there aren't enough people talking about this subject. And the trajectory, I'm sorry to say, of US government programming that's invested in supporting knowledge about this subject is downward across the board. Title VIII, long story why it's called Title VIII, um, is only a three and a half million dollar program that supported research on the former Soviet space. That was the reason I lived in Kiev a year ago with my family doing research for the US Embassy. As of October, remember this whole thing started in November, as of October of last year, we were notified Title VIII was being eliminated by the State Department of this administration. The same State Department that is sending its officials down to the Maidan to hand out bagels and promise $50 million of non-lethal military aid, et cetera, cannot invest $3.5 million so that we have Americans who know what's going on in this part of the world. Tell me how that makes sense. I want to close by reading you an unbelievable quotation from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the famous dissident Soviet writer, from a letter he wrote to a colleague in North America in 1981. He said this. The Ukrainian question is one of the most dangerous questions facing us in the future. On both sides, we are mentally poorly prepared to face it. I'd like to bring reconciliation to heal this dangerous split. Just as it is useless to prove to Ukrainians that we all hail by blood and in spirit from Kiev, so too Russians do not want to appreciate that those living along the Dnieper are a different people, and that many injuries and grievances were sown by the Bolsheviks. It will be very difficult to guide this conversation to a sensible haven. But whatever voice and weight I have, I shall apply it to this end. In any case, I know one thing. Should there arise, God forbid, a Russo-Ukrainian war, I won't join it myself, and I won't let my sons go. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, more than 30 years ago, understood the nature of Russia's relations with Ukraine. We need to understand it today. And lastly, let me just advise patience. Patience, patience, patience. This is a thousand-year-old problem. It's not going to be solved overnight. 
I think we need to remember to apply strategic patience. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. Uh, I urge you to write down your questions, give them to the ushers who are coming around. And until then, let me start with one. If I had thought yesterday or even today that we would have a seminar on this subject in which the Malaysian airliner was not mentioned, I would not believe it. So my question is, is it as important as those media in the United States have made it? Is it the game changer we said it was going to be, or something much different from that? Okay. Um, thank you, Bob. So I would, I would say that I was remiss in, in not talking about MH17, except that if I had talked to you about MH17, then I would have had to talk to you about the Russian artillery shells that went across the border two days later, and then the Ukrainian air raid against civilians in eastern Ukraine that happened the day after that, and then the U.S. intelligence that came out that said that they have hard proof that Putin is ordering the separatists and controlling the separatists in eastern Ukraine, and then I'd have to talk to you about the sanctions that have been announced. My point here is this is an unbelievably fast-moving target. What I want you all to understand are the fundamentals that I talked about here. MH17 is a part of this story. Uh, and it might even have been a game changer. I think, I think it's too early to say. I think maybe what we're seeing now with the Europeans coming around to the idea, a little bit like the idea that Americans have had, which is, well, sanctions may not be likely to work. And in fact, they may be likely to do more harm than good. And I think Europeans, by the way, understand this because they live with Russia. Remember, Russia is the biggest country in Europe. It is their neighbor. And particularly when you think about the Germans, they're very careful with Russia. I mean, who are the Germans who invaded the Soviet Union, resulting in 25 million deaths? Who are they to tell the Russians how they should behave in their neighborhood, right? I'm not making this moral argument. I'm just trying to explain how Germans see it, right? In this context, nonetheless, 200 plus EU citizens who died in the Malaysian airline crash in eastern Ukraine is motivation enough, I think, to change the domestic politics in Western Europe. And I think that's part of the reason. Think about the countries that suffered most, right? The Netherlands has always had a very close commercial and political relationship with Russia. All of a sudden, they have more than 100 deaths on their hands. The UK, of course, has been a strong advocate of sanctions. Um, there were German victims. There were Belgians. So I think that has changed the political calculus to some extent. But I think the Europeans are going to continue to be more careful than the Americans for the same reason that the Americans are almost always leading the charge on issues of uh, geopolitics, American values, freedom, and so on, which is we don't live there, right? So we can afford to be a little more wrong than the people who do. Let me build on, on that to stay with sanctions for a minute. And you said there were new sanctions. Uh, th there's a view that the old sanctions weren't very meaningful. but. How can the West impose meaningful sanctions with all of the uh, interactions that they have, whether it's banking in the UK, arms sales in France, energy in Germany, or other things? Uh, are the, is this new batch going to be any more effective than the old or not? Well, OK, first of all, I don't know exactly what the new batch contains yet. Uh, all we know is that these are going to be sectoral sanctions that are targeting industries rather than individuals. So that means bigger in some way than they've been before. What we don't know is, is it going to be an attempt to have a complete blockade on certain sectors of the Russian economy? I would posit it doesn't take a genius to understand that if 70% of Russia's export revenue comes from the export of energy products, then probably that would be a pretty effective tool of leverage. But that's a two-way street. So the way that sanctions works, you have to think about three things. One, you have to know what you want. I'm not sure we know what we want from the Russians. We keep telling them, end the conflict. But can they? Putin has let a genie out of a bottle in southeastern Ukraine that I'm not sure he can control. 
I'm not saying he doesn't have a relationship with these people and that he's not supplying them and that he couldn't stop supplying them if he wanted to. There's a lot more he could do. But the problem is Putin in his own house of cards domestically is trying to balance between radical, rabid Russian nationalism of the kind that he has empowered and unleashed in southeastern Ukraine and more moderate, pro-business, pragmatic forces. And that's a very hard job. And what he's done is dramatically empower one side of that equation. And I'm not sure at the end of the day that this whole wild, crazy story doesn't end in a revolution in Russia, but not a Euro revolution, a nationalist revolution, a coup against Putin because of the forces he's unleashed. So I'm doubtful, number one, that if we knew what we wanted of him and it was end the conflict, that he could do it. Number two, we need to know what is the pressure point that gets him to do that. And I'm still not sure, even if we could do a complete energy blockade, I'm not sure that's enough. Remember, the Russians have signed what is admittedly a long-term deal, but a very big deal to sell energy to the Chinese. Energy's fungible, right? As long as they can get it to market in the short term or in the middle term, they can weather the storm. They have something to sell that people will always want to buy. And then the third is credibility. So we've threatened things. Do we actually follow through? And how long do we hold on to those consequences? And I'm not sure that our recent practice on any of those issues is, is, is highly confidence-inducing in terms of the credibility with which the Russians will see any of these threats. Let's talk about Putin. If you were Putin, what would you do next? And you know, under what uh, circumstances would you, as Putin, invade Ukraine? Or having patience, do you think uh, that may not be necessary? And then finally, what would happen if Putin was, and here the question has quotes, was incapacitated mm. tomorrow? Okay, so, so good, important questions. Uh, just the first observation I want to make is Putin is a fascinating guy, fascinating part of this story. Uh, you can write and read whole books about Putin. Uh, you know, there have been a couple of documentary films. I'm waiting for the Hollywood movie about Vladimir Putin. It's going to be amazing. Um, and let me recommend Ben Kingsley. But, no, I'm kidding. But, um, and I would also like to be a consultant on that film. But, but let me suggest that preoccupation with, with Putin's personality, it's not that he doesn't play a vital role, the most important role, but preoccupation with his personality and his predilections doesn't get us as far as we might think it does. So in the absence of Putin, uh, I don't know that things get better necessarily. Like I said, Putin uh, is a force in Russia in some ways for moderation and compromise. He is holding together a number of competing oligarchic factions. He is holding together and controlling, for the moment, radical nationalists, liberals who oppose them, uh, ordinary statist Russians, deeply cynical people who are frustrated that, they haven't, that their lives haven't gotten much, much better after 25 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So Putin, in some ways, is actually vital to the um, kind of benevolence of Russia's relatively non-threatening position in the world today. After all, for all of our huffing and puffing about Russia's role in Ukraine, how many of you wake up worried that Russia is going to nuke the United States today? No one, right? Go back 40 or 50 years. We had a very different relationship with the Kremlin. So Putin is, in many ways, I think, important in a positive respect to US-Russia stability. And I would worry about, about that being uh, destabilized. In terms of what he's likely to do in Ukraine, though, I think it actually is a, is a two-sided coin. I think on the one hand, Putin has very little interest in invading Ukraine outright. I've been really surprised and, and frankly somewhat dubious about the intelligence claims that there is actual shelling uh, or actual missiles being launched from the Russian side of the border uh, over onto Ukrainian territory because that's not really been his style so far. He prefers plausible deniability. And he prefers it for a simple reason, which is a lot of people in Ukraine itself believe his side of the story. A lot of people that you ask in eastern Ukraine believe that what has happened in Kiev is a fascist coup backed by the United States. And as long as Putin can credibly tell that story and keep Ukraine divided, then Ukraine presents no threat to him, and the West is unable to threaten Russia or deteriorate Russia's position in the region through Ukraine. And that's what he sees as the biggest threat. So what I would expect from Putin here is a continuity of this plausible deniability. 
where on the surface he talks about a ceasefire, negotiations, needing both sides to lay down their weapons, at the same time that the border remains open, weapons continue to flow to the Russian separatists, and he does whatever he can to complicate life for the Ukrainian authorities so that they can't mount an effective military response. That's what I expect. Let's swing over to the U.S. You had the Kennan Institute, which I learned recently was not named after George F. Kennan, the, uh, but one of his relatives, and has a wonderful uh, library because of that. But uh, if you were the George F. Kennan advising presidents and advising this president about what's going on, you said before we're being played, but how should the U.S., Obama, under your guidance, uh, react or NATO's guidance react to the current situation? Uh, so it's a fantastic question. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry to say. Thank you for the question, uh, but let me disappoint you. I'm not George F. Kennan. Um, I don't think we have a George F. Kennan right now. I don't think we have um, any individual or even uh, an institutional class of individuals in the United States. And it's no surprise, right? We've stopped paying for it. You get what you pay for. Um, who, who have both the knowledge and the gravitas and experience um, that they are listened to and taken seriously in Washington. I mean, Washington doesn't care what I have to say. That's why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, seriously, the, 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 one, the one piece of advice that I would give, um, and, and again, I think, uh, I think there are people in government who understand this, but policy making is a complex process, is we need to judge our Ukrainian partners not by what they say, but by what they do. So Pavlo Klimkin, a guy I've known for quite some time, is now the foreign minister of Ukraine. He's visiting Washington right now today. I'm actually very pleased that I'm not there. Um, and, and where is he going in Washington? He's going to uh, the Atlantic Council, which is the sort of NATO, the, the kind of outgrowth of the NATO and the transatlantic organization. Uh, and he's going to the Business Council, and he's going to those two institutions for two, and he's going to meet government officials. All for the same reason, which is to ask for money, right? What the Ukrainians want from us now is money. They want love, political love, which translates into money. They want money for the military, they want money so that they can continue to subsidize the lifestyle that Ukrainian leaders have always had, so that they don't have to be answerable to the angry people in the Maidan who I talked about. And guess what? We're giving it to them. We opened the floodgates of IMF money, and we're giving it to them because we're allowing them to tell us a story which says the Russians are the bad guys, and we're the heroes, and you're the cavalry that's going to save us. And if you believe me when I tell you that that story is flawed, then we might want to think about spending our resources differently. But I think the, the, the vital principle here is fine. Let them tell us that story, but let's judge them by their actions. So if they actually begin to reform their country, if they actually root out corruption, if it actually happens that Ukrainian government ministries don't just show up at a businessman's doorstep demanding extortionist uh, payments, then I think we can begin to support them in a more meaningful way. But for now, all we have are promises and a, and a sort of egotistical depiction of ourselves as being the answer to Ukraine's problems. In Steamboat, interest in the Ukraine didn't start with any of the things that you talked about. It started with the Olympics. And there was a lot of criticism beforehand about whether it would succeed. And then after it was a pretty successful Olympics, except unfortunately for some hometown athletes, um, the, uh, there was a lot of concern about whether Putin got a raw deal from the press. And then the question came up, which was asked is, did his success in the Olympics give him any feeling that maybe he could go and invade uh, the Ukraine or give him the credibility to seize uh, the part of Crimea that he did? That's a, that's a very important question. I, I believe it's the opposite. I believe the narrative of the Sochi Olympics, so you all, you all know if you were paying attention uh, to the, the sort of um, mainstream press narrative that this was a very expensive, somewhat subpar undertaking, where there was a lot of corruption and a lot of shoddily built last minute kind of infrastructure. But it was very expensive. 
It was a $50 billion undertaking that was a personal prestige project for the Tsar, for Mr. Putin. And Putin wanted appreciation for that project, not only from ordinary Russians, which, by the way, he got. I mean, Russians were enormously proud and enormously excited about the Sochi Olympics, and they're very excited about sports and, and athletics in general, as are we. Um, but what he didn't get was the recognition that he wanted from the international community. You might remember that in uh, as early as November and December and then January, uh, one after another, heads of state were dropping like flies off the Sochi agenda. They refused to come for various reasons, mostly about Russian politics, mostly about the way that Russia uh, treated gays and lesbians, uh, the way that Russia treated uh, political dissidents uh, like Pussy Riot, the, the punk rock group, uh, the way that Russia treated Mr. Khodorkovsky, the oligarch who'd been in jail for a decade, the way that Russia treated the Greenpeace activists in the Arctic. Well, guess what? Mr. Putin heard those criticisms. And by the end of 2013, he released all of those groups that I mentioned. And although he can't change the fact that Russian society is very conservative, it simply feels very differently about alternative lifestyles than, than we do in the West, he promised that there would be no issues for gay and lesbian athletes or spectators at Sochi. So in other words, and I'm not saying he did any of this out of the goodness of his heart. He did it because he wanted recognition. He changed everything that the West asked him to change, and nobody came. And so if you're Vladimir Putin, and you're sitting in Sochi, and you have just been insulted in this way by President Obama and Chancellor Merkel and everybody else who was supposed to come for your party, and none of them came to your party. And in the meantime, what do you see happening? They're setting up a new tin pot fascist dictatorship right next door to your house in Ukraine. What are you going to do? Right? Again, I'm not trying to justify this. I'm trying to show you how, from Putin's perspective, what was going on was that he was being insulted at the same time that he was being outflanked and threatened. And that, I think, explains a lot of the response and the suddenness of the invasion of Crimea. I don't think it was that he felt emboldened after Sochi. I think he felt threatened. How about then two, two final questions, and I'll ask them both. Okay. Um, in the same sense, what, what will his reaction be to the sanctions, including this new batch of sanctions? Will he feel emboldened or threatened? Um, and uh, you know, will the U.S. be able to and the Europeans go further in order to try to stop him from doing what he is doing, number one. And the second question is, you mentioned a little bit about uh, social media, but a lot of it are conspiracy theories. And why, are, why does conspiracy theories get so much traction in Russia? That's great. Um, all right, first on sanctions. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know because I don't know what these sanctions are going to look like yet. I think we're going to know that soon, probably within the next week. Um, what I can say is m more than what the administration has already said. The administration has already said it's important to leave the Russians an exit ramp, right? So the whole point of sanctions is to compel different behavior. So they have to have a way of behaving differently. Um, but I think the way that we have defined the exit ramp so far is unacceptable to Putin. And therefore, it makes the approach of our sanctions unlikely to succeed. It, the, the, the exit ramp, as we have defined it, is do everything as we say, except that you are responsible for Ukraine's current situation and end Ukraine's current situation, which I've already explained why I think may not be entirely possible for Putin. But the problem here is, even if these sanctions are so overwhelming that Putin has to choose between an absolutely devastated Russian economy and complying with the West's demands. What he can't accept is being put in the domestic political position that he's been bullied by someone else. Because once the Tsar is getting pushed around by anybody at home or abroad, he's not going to be the Tsar for very much longer. So go back to what I explained about Putin's top interest here, right? Survival, survival, survival. Uh, on conspiracy theories, this is endlessly fascinating to those of us who spend time in the region. I mean, I can spend hours and hours over vodka or beers or tea with my, with my Russian and Ukrainian friends hearing about the real reasons why America has done what it's done, right? And, and there's, it, it's very true, and it's very deeply true that people in the post-Soviet space are always looking for a deeper truth. And 
I've come around, I think there are, there are other competing explanations for this, um, and, and there may not be a satisfying explanation, but I've come around to the belief that the reason for this is their experience of governments, not only in Soviet times, but also in post-Soviet times. Anybody with power in these societies is usually lying to them, is usually using that power to take something and is being dishonest about it. And for that reason, when they see the most powerful nation on the planet, which seems to get the lion's share of all the benefits on the planet, namely us, telling a story about why we're doing what we're doing, that to them is the most salient evidence that, well, that at least is not true. So now we can begin to look for the real explanations. <laughs> and it leaves this vacuum that, you know, hey, Russians are unbelievably creative, you know, and, and, and they come up with some amazing stories. Thank you. We, just one, one word first. Um, as you said, Matt, this, isn't, this is far from over, and it's going to evolve. But what we sitting here now have to think about it tomorrow, the next day, and the next couple of weeks are tools that we didn't have before. And for that, we thank you. Thank you.